Hello, good morning, how are you? It's another lovely day in paradise. Bit windy, been very windy. Here yeah, Mrs. Angry decided that we like that we don't like the wind. We don't mind the rain. And we love the sun. But we don't like the wind. Too destructive. Let's throw a McDonald's bag out the window. It's funny, they always do it on the corners. I don't know why. I suppose it's like, you know, just nip around the corner and do something naughty. Anyway, who would have thought on a dental podcast or vodcast that you would have so much to talk about, honestly? I had two really interesting cases in recently that are going to contribute a chapter each to my book on how to be a general practitioner. And the first one was a guy who came in, his teeth are wrecked, and he told me that he wanted to have a, his teeth uh, repaired to the extent that he's a semi-professional trumpet player. And he wants to... Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's come in because he's got to the point where he can't play the trumpet. So we looked at his mouth and I said to him, look, you know, you need a lot of work, your, your teeth are wrecked. But um, let just get very straight, right from the beginning, I'm going to give you absolutely no guarantee that you're going to be able to play um, a penny whistle, let alone a trumpet at the end of it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know whether he can play the trumpet anyway. It's like that bloke who says, you know, has an operation on his arm and says to the doctor, can I play, the, after this operation, will I be able to play the piano? And the doctor said, yeah, I think so. And he said, well, that's great, because I couldn't play it before. And, you know, I don't know anything about his trumpet playing. And I'm not, you know, this is defensive dentistry, right? This is that woman who cost, eight, cost us £8,000 because we failed to diagnose one filling for six months. And this is what I was saying when I said talking about defensive dentistry. I am not going to put my job on the line for someone who's wrecked their teeth because my job would be on the line and I'll explain to you how. He uh, disappeared then for nine months. We didn't hear a word from him. And anyway, he came back and he said, look, he said, I'm still, uh, you know, I'm in the same state, if not, if, if not worse, obviously. And uh, I, still, I still want to get my teeth fixed. So what can you do for me? So I said, well, I don't know, because obviously in nine months, the situation might have changed. And when we came in last time, we only did like the preliminary look round. We didn't even do any x-rays because we spent so much time talking about his trumpet playing. So, he said, you know, I've been doing a bit of Googling and uh, I thought perhaps I could have a horseshoe denture. Because the problem is I don't want to cover up the roof of my mouth because when I'm doing the wobbly notes on the trumpet, that's, I need to wobble my uvula and I don't, it, it can't be covered up. So, like, I mean, honestly, I'm out of my depth here. He's out of his depth, I'm out of my depth. I don't mind because any dentist would be out of their depth. Nobody, as far as I know, I mean, there may be studies on uh, denture wearing trumpet players, but I, I, they're not accessible to me. Most research is, is locked up pretty tightly behind some sort of paywall. So even if it's carried out at public expense, it's still, you know, for, for the purpose of selling it. So. You know, basically, I don't want to touch this guy with a barge pole. Not because I don't have any sympathy with him, but because I can see it ending my career. And at my age, the, the GDC is going to, you know, the only protection to treating the guy like this is to have some sort of consultant status or postgraduate degree or something, or, or even be a trumpet player. But not, um, you know, someone like me is going to get roasted if he can't play the trumpet like Louis Armstrong by the time the work's finished. 
And, you know, I mean, you may think I'm exaggerating, but, you know, the way that I've seen the General Dental Council work over 40 years, and the way they work is that they, that there is a presumption of guilt. You're guilty until proven innocent at the GDC. And as far as I know, nobody has ever been proven innocent. Nobody. Uh, they think that their job is to um, uh, act on behalf of the patients to remove all the substandard dentists in the world, or in the UK at least. And, um, you know, they, they have, like, I don't say they've, they haven't got, literally got a quota, but I mean, they have got in their heads, they don't think they're doing a good job unless someone gets slung off uh, every day. And it's totally captured by the lawyers, you know, even to the point where the lawyers have managed to persuade the General Dental Council that a bunch of dentists who are unlikely to ever return to the profession, dentists in their 70s, dentists who've sold their practices, dentists who've moved abroad, that they have to have a nine day hearing to strike these people off because they could at any time decide to come back to the UK and practice again. And if they hadn't been struck off at enormous expense to the taxpayer, then uh, by, by the taxpayer, I mean the dentist who, who you know, then passes the charges on to the patients, then, uh, you know, then justice is not done. Whereas in fact, there, I'm sure there would be a shortcut to um, dealing with people who are, would sign, sign a voluntary uh, uh, agreement not to reapply to the register. That's all it takes. You want to say, look, you know, you're being, uh, you're up before the, the beak for negligence, but if you, you know, bearing in mind you live in America now and you're in your 70s, if you sign this bit of paper, it'll all go away <laughs> like with your career. So, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's how a lot of dentists end. There's no happy ending really for a lot of dentists. It's, uh, you know, it's a, there's a pack mentality and uh, if you're not running with the pack, you're not one of the young hounds. Uh, if you're an old dog and you're towards the edge of the pack or at the back of the pack, then uh, you get cold and the GDC is the body that culls you. Well, if I was a consultant and I rebuilt this guy's mouth and um, he then complained that he couldn't play the trumpet, um, the GDC would take the attitude that, you know, that, you know you're a consultant, you've done, you're obviously a learned guy, you're obviously a clever guy, intelligent guy, um, you've got a lot of applied knowledge, um, you get all the cases, the hopeless cases, the cases that other dentists have given up on, uh, are, are sent to you, and you can't win them all, you know, I mean, you can, you're, you're allowed, you are allowed to fail, because you get the cases that where, that where the failures are embedded in the cases that you get referred. Uh, and so if one of them fails, that's, you know, if only out of 50 cases that are referred to you, if you only succeed once, then that's once more than the dentist that referred them. So, you know, you're net, there's a net benefit to what you do. Whereas if I was to do the case and the patient then came back and said, uh, you know, I can't play the trumpet, um, which was the whole purpose of, of trying to get my mouth rebuilt, um, and, and which I made plain at the beginning was my objective, then the General Dental Council would say, look, um, you know, they would be very polite and they'll ask me how I did it all and everything, I would explain how I did it and uh, express my regret that, you know, unfortunately his tram trumpet playing days were, not, were numbered. But then in private, in discussion at the end, they would, discussion would run along the lines of what, what was this guy thinking? What, what on earth did he, uh, you know, what, what motivated him to try and take on what was obviously a very specialist uh, vertical market dental treatment for trumpet players. He had no experience, not even, you know, what experience did he have at treating trumpet players? How many trumpet players has he treated previously? How many musicians had he treated previously, you know? They're, and the answer will be none, none and none. And, and so they would say, well, what possessed him to do something which was so obviously outside his scope of practice? 
and outside his experience? And they'll uh, easily answer that question. They'll say, well, it, that was money. He was greedy. He basically saw the, the dollar bills. And so he said, yeah, all right, then I'll have a bash at that. And, um, and as expected, it all went tits up because he, he really didn't know what he was doing or he couldn't guarantee a result. And he should have referred it to a specialist, who, uh, and he didn't. And he kept the greenbacks, and um, uh, he's obviously uh, uh, the dodgiest of the dodgy, and therefore deserves a break from general practice, which at my age would mean retirement. Because I'm the, you know, I mean, they brought in this rule, didn't they, that you can't, you can't disqualify a dentist from practicing for a couple of weeks or a month or, or six months. Uh, you have to go the whole five years as a minimum tariff for. Uh, uh, the GDC and it's five years and up and that's again it's designed to force you out of the profession you know there are very few dentists can afford to take five years out of the profession and then and then come back into it especially when you consider all the you know you've got to keep doing your CPD all the time and and you'd have to have it done privately I presume because you can't you're not a dentist are you I don't know what the rule is on <laughs> dentists who've been struck off coming to CPD courses uh, probably have to do it at your own expense. So, uh, with, and then you'd have no income. So, from the patient's point of view, he's like, uh, you know, I, I want to have another go at this because it is affecting me. I, uh, you know, I do, I, I'm increasingly having trouble playing the trumpet or I can't get bookings because I can't play the trumpet. I'm losing money here. And um, so it's, it's important to me. And when he said to me, like, you know, well, can't, you know, I've had a think and perhaps you could do a horseshoe denture. Uh, that was an immediate, that's not only is that a, a, a red light, that's a bloody klaxon and a bell going off as well. Because, not that I, you know, I mean, I don't mind patients researching on the internet and I don't mind them expressing a preference as to what they have done but there's a very uh you know we've got two of these guys on at the moment they do tend to be sort of guys in their 60s and 70s uh we've got another guy on the go who's um came in and said uh i've come to you because my nhs dentist has chucked me out and i've tried to get into the family dentist and the family dentist is full up so they can't take me so so that's so i'm here so i'm like and I said to Lou at the time, you know, we are not, we're not just his third preference. We're, we're, we're at the end of the line of any NHS dentist that would take him. So, so he needs a couple of fillings and a bit of brushing instruction and then probably a couple of crowns. Um, and also he's got this sharp tooth which was rubbing his gum, which I said I'd like to smooth off for him straight away, but he refused. Because he's, he's one of these guys, and we've all met them, who are like, you know, I... I don't want anything done and until it's absolutely necessary. And even then, I don't really want to have it anything more than the absolute minimum done. So, so you know, and then <clears throat> he's like, he's, he's must have sent me five emails since saying, because uh, I said to him, look, I'll get your mouth healthy and we'll do your fillings. And then, uh, you know, you can, you'll probably want your NHS dentist to do your crowns or your family dentist to do your crowns or something so obviously you know you're only here on a temporary basis basically because you can't get anywhere else so I'm not going to do a load of work on your mouth I'm just going to do the basics get you already healthy and then you can decide then you know where where you want to go for the next phase so I don't want to do a load of crowns on someone who's just going to immediately go to another dentist and then you know we like to um What's the objection? I mean, the objection is not that he's going to go to another dentist. The objection is that he's, um, we like to do treatment by consent. And by definition, someone who's been forced to come and see me and really hasn't, you know, has got a track record of not taking my advice in the past uh, because of not having this jagged tooth that's caused his best great health and his cheeks moved off. And obviously, he's a minimalist in terms of attendance. He's not really a good candidate for crowns. That's what it boils down to. So anyway, he keeps emailing me and saying, uh, well, you know, do, will I 
have a choice. He said, could you do the crowns? Could you do the crowns? And I said, yes. I said, we could do the crowns, but really that's died down the line. We want to establish a relationship with you, get to know you a bit, work out whether you're a regular attender, whether you are any good at brushing your teeth, whether you've got your decay under control, uh, you know, work out how easy you are to do fillings on. You might be a nightmare. You might be gagging all over the place. You might be poor access. There's any number of reasons why I'm not going to say yes. I'll get yourself booked in for two crowns right now, okay? So then, so I said to him, I wrote him a nice, very polite letter saying, yeah, uh, yeah, down the line, crowns definitely, but at the moment, smooth off a tooth, get your fillings done. So then he wrote this other next letter, then this is the funny one, saying, but, but will I have a choice? When I come in, will I have a choice to have the crowns done? Right? And he, that's, he put that in a sort of a funny way, you know? So, and again, experience comes in here because you need to know how to deal with these people. Um, your, the answer is, you know, uh, what do you do? You can't write back and say, yes, you have a choice, or no, you don't have a choice. If I write back and say, yes, you have a choice, you're going to say, in that case, I choose to have them done, get them, get them booked. And if I say to him, no, you don't have a choice, then he's like, well, uh, what sort of dentist are you, you know, that recommends crowns and then won't do them? So basically the whole um, do I have a choice question is answered by the fact that, yes, patients have a choice out of the options which are offered to them, which are clinically sensible. And what we do is we triage the uh, treatment and we make clinical recommendations as the GDC recommends so that it goes, it goes check up, uh, offer options, patient, and then agree agree treatment with the patient. So, well, what's the point of that? There's a junction there, but you're going to stop now. You've got exactly 10 feet ahead of me through that manoeuvre. Wasted 20 pence worth of petrol and risked an accident by overtaking in a place where nobody ever overtakes. So, so, yeah, the answer is, yeah, you're not, you have got a choice. When you're offered a choice, you will have a choice. But at the moment, you're not, the, the choice is not appropriate at the moment. That's Manston down there. That's just in case any of you are interested in this on the news. That is the Manston, this is Manston Airfield, and that is the Manston Barracks, where they're keeping all the um, Albanian economic migrants. So having sort of, you know, and we get this a bit because having been so sort of standoffish and like, well, you know, you're going to have to put up a bloody good case to touch my teeth. You know, let, I shall be the judge of whether or not you're, you're a good enough dentist to touch me. And, in, in you, you're going to have to really convince me to get any work done for I'll, I'll going to part with my money. He's now gone the other way round because he realized he's made a bit of a prat of himself by saying, you know, I'm only here again against my better judgment and because no one I can't get in anywhere else and then when we've said well like we don't care we don't care we're booked up three weeks ahead you know what I mean we just don't care he's we I'm quite happy just doing the basics on him and then and then you know I mean if he's got a fractured tooth or something then then obviously we'll deal with it but I'm not going to um do, do a restore his tooth with a fracture in it and promise him that we're going to crown it at the same time Anyway, so that's the point. It's the micromanagement that is, you have to watch out for. It's not, you know, you just have to you just have to watch out for it. That's all I'm saying. Like it doesn't compromise your rights. It doesn't compromise their rights. It doesn't compromise their right to consent. It doesn't compromise their right to research their treatment. Uh oh, sorry, you got hit on the hit on the head then, didn't you? So, <coughs> and then so and then I've got this other guy saying. I think the horseshoe denture is what I need. And I'm like, I said to him, like, okay, I understand what you're trying to do and be helpful and micromanage your treatment and everything. But I said, but my 40 years experience tell me if I make you a horseshoe denture, the minute you puff on the trumpet, it's going to come flying out because there, there won't be any retention. I said, you're, you know, we need to think about something that's a little bit more stable, a bit fixed, you know, something that doesn't move about. 
there's a lot of pressure on your front teeth when you play a trumpet. At least I do know that. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Anyway, he's coming in. But as the final, final parting salvo, he said to me, because uh, he'd been in nine months ago, and he said to me, does my, my checkup that you did last time, does that not cover uh, the, the consultation that you and I are going to have, you know, about doing the further x-rays and the treatment planning and everything? And I said to him, well, broadly speaking, the checkup, if someone's had a checkup and they need to come back within six months, I said, we won't charge them for two checkups in six months. But if your checkup was nine months ago, so, and that's long enough really for me to need to, to say that I can't rely on what I found at that checkup in, in doing your treatment planning. So, uh, yeah, so you'll have to pay for another checkup, me another 45 quid. Now, um, he's like, oh, and there it is, you see, in that, in that, just that last question about whether or not he needs to pay for another checkup. You've got the um, the nub of the problem, isn't it? Which is that he doesn't have the funding to do this. I mean, anyone. I mean, we charge forty-five pounds for a checkup. Anyone who's going to Turkey, please note. And the fact that he <clears throat> is trying to save forty-five quid by saying that you know perhaps I could uh, not bother with examining his mouth to the extent that I need to charge him any money perhaps he could come in free of charge for that part of the work you know um, I mean you know perhaps I'm being stupid perhaps there's a bloke there who's he might have saved anything up to five grand for all I know and it may be that he's you know I can lose the cost of that checkup in the treatment or I could do something like saying like I did the other day when I did a filling on someone's tooth that needs a crown and I said because we don't you know I said what you can do, you can either decide to stay with the filling, in which case obviously we charge you for it, or if you do decide to get a crown done, I'll file it down and do a crown and I'll rebate the cost of the filling against the crown. You know, either way I'm, I'm quite happy to do that. I know I, don't, I shouldn't have to and I don't have to, but, um, but in this case I did. Um, so I could say to this bloke, look, yeah, come in, but pay you 45 quid and then I'll just rebate it across, against the cost of any treatment. But it's far more likely to go the other way. It's far more likely that he's going to come in, he'll, he'll pay his 45 quid, he'll spend half an hour arguing with me, I'll end up taking full mouth x-rays, for which we don't charge, um, and doing a, a massively, you know, a, a, a big treatment plan, and then, or uh, even worse, just saying to know you need a referral to a specialist, and then he's having placed no value at all on my uh, assessment uh, will be missed. He's had to pay £45 to be told that he, we can't do anything for him. He needs to go somewhere else. And so I'll end up refunding his 45 quid. You know, I'll just say to him, like, you know, on the basis, we, we charge you 45 quid on the basis that we might be able to treat you. But we find that we can't treat you. We're going to refer you. So therefore, I'll, I'll refund what you pay for our assessment which I shouldn't have to, and I don't have to, but I probably will. So I'm a, I'm a hiding to nothing here. I've got this guy who's intellectually not all, all there, because he hasn't realized that as a trumpet player, there are two truisms. One is, if you're a trumpet player, you need to look after your teeth. You have to look after your oral health. You can't be a trumpet player and, and neglect your mouth. Uh, otherwise, uh, at some point, you won't be a trumpet player. And the other thing is that if you're a trumpet player and you have neglected your mouth and, and all your teeth are wrecked, then it's going to be big bucks. You need to be a very famous trumpet player to afford the sort of bucks that it's going to cost you to get your mouth rehabilitated to the point where you can, you, you know, you're back to where you... Count Basie, standard of trumpet playing. So, and the fact that he's asked if he can save 45 quid on the checkup leads me to suspect that he he's can't 
go by either of those rules. He's allowed his mouth to become wrecked and he does not have the financial resources to get himself out of the pit. He's dug for himself. And so obviously, you know, the I think the problem with the dentistry as I've gone through my profession, it's not so much that, you know, not the old cliche that we cause pain. Because, you know, I mean, sometimes we might cause pain giving someone an injection, but it's to alleviate a greater pain or potential problem, isn't it? It's, and a lot of time we alleviate pain. So that really, I'm not that worried about that. But I'll tell you what I have found is one major aspect of the job, especially these days, um, is just giving people bad news. It's just explaining to them that they've, they're in a right difficult predicament. And it can be, and it's a lot of the time it's financial, you know. A lot of the time it's like a, I don't know, a builder who's not been in for 10 years and needs 2,000 pounds worth of remedial work. And who can find 2,000 pounds, you know? Who can find, most new patients who come to me have to find three, a large three digit sum, I would say like 600, 700, 800 is not uncommon. And certainly um, 2,000, 3,000 is, is also not uncommon and people just don't budget for this they just don't they haven't they, they, it's not even on their radar you know that they might have to the, the nhs dentistry might not be there and they might have to find two or three thousand pounds that they would normally put towards a car deposit or a holiday or something and um, uh, towards their teeth and it's a painful process of re-education for the public you know including the people who say no you know i've um I can't have my treatment done because I'm on holiday that week and then when I come back, can I have it done a bit at a time because I haven't got the money? And you think, well, you had the money to go on holiday. So again, it's as Kevin Lewis used to say, it's priorities as well. But this guy, I don't know, I'll let you know whether or not we end up treating him. I don't, I'm inclined to say we won't because I'm just not, I'm just practicing too defensively to let this guy. And, and, the, and the last thing I'd say is the percentage thing. If you say to someone like, there's a 5% chance that this won't work, right? They're like, oh, 5% chance, well, it's fine. One in 20, 5% chance, that's fine. But then when it doesn't work, they're like, oh. Because for them, five has suddenly gone to 100, hasn't it? For them, it hasn't worked. They're, they're, the, they're the one that didn't work. But they don't want to be that one, do they? They want to be one of the 19 that did work. So uh, it doesn't matter whether you say there's a 5% chance that he, he won't be able to play the trumpet at the end of it. He's not thinking that, that it's either for him, it'll either be a hundred percent he will or a hundred percent he won't. And if, if it's a hundred percent he won't, then he won't, he won't, uh, he, he's going to go to the GDC and he's going to say something stupid like Mr. Watson said that there was, there was a small chance that I couldn't play the trumpet out there. Or Mr. Watson said that, um, you know, he was hopeful that I would be able to play the trumpet after the end of this. And, and I relied upon that. I relied, I relied upon his optimism. You know, and, uh, and I, I, or, or something like, if I'd have known, I wouldn't be able to play the trumpet afterwards, I wouldn't have done this. You know, so, so that's it. So I've, actually, that's, I've just decided I'm not going to see him. All right. Okay. Nice to talk to you. Bye.